So I'm going to talk about insect scale micro aerial robot powered by soft artificial muscles today. And if you look at the title, there are two keywords, being micro and soft. I want to spend the first 10 minutes or so explaining to you what are micro robots. And then I'm going to talk about our new focus in MIT, which is to create a new class of soft actuated micro scale robot. So when people think about robots, people usually think about large scale robots, such as legged robots, humanoid robots, or trains or airplanes. They span the scale of meters to the scale of hundreds of meters. On the other end of the spectrum, you can think about very tiny robots made of the MEMS technology. They usually range from tens of microns to hundreds of microns. What I want to talk about today is focusing on insect scale robots, and they range from one to five centimeter, and they weigh from 10 milligram to 10 grams. As a very quick example, when I was a student at Howard, we worked on a very famous project called the RoboBee. If you compare this robot with bees in nature, it weighs similarly, and it flaps its wings at a similar frequency. So very quickly, I want to address several important questions together. The first one is, why do we study micro-robots? Right? To me, there are two answers. The first one is, by leveraging interesting physics at the centimeter scale, you can enable new functions in robots. In this case, by exploiting flow similarity, we show the same robot is both able to fly and swim. And more than that, you can use microscale robot as a platform to investigate uh, interesting physics at the centimeter scale. By looking at the flow field generated by a flapping wing robot, you can infer about the lift and drag generation mechanism of a flapping wing bee. Okay, so that's the first question. The, f the second question I want to ask is, what makes micro robot unique? In short, at this scale, the inertia become a lot less important and surface effect become a lot more important. So as a consequence, new properties arise. For example, you can drop a robot from very high above and see a very small amount of changes to its performance. You can climb along and see you know, no change to performance. And more than that, my colleague has been able to show that microscale robot can jump off the surface of water. I would argue that this is something that's very challenging, if not impossible, for larger scale robot. And the third question I want to uh, ask is, what are potential applications of microscale robot? In the short term, we can think about a lot of applications. For example, in this case, we are thinking about putting a microscale robot inside of a turbine engine and put tiny cameras on board to look for cracks inside of a turbine engine. So this is a very niche uh, inspection test that's very challenging for traditional robotics. In the longer term, we are thinking about deploying a large number of microscale robots into very complex environment. You know, in this picture, you see fire, collapse houses, and, uh, and water. So I would say that this is a fairly far-fetched picture. We are still 10, 20 years away from this. And I'll come back to some of those challenges toward the end of this talk. So today, I want to tell you about three examples of microscale robot. The first two examples, I'm going to uh, sort of talk about them relatively quickly with the theme of showing you that although being very tiny, microscale robot can do multiple things in multiple environment that are sometimes very challenging for larger scale robotics. And then in most part of today's talk, I'm going to focus on the third topic, which is something that we have been focusing on in MIT, creating a new class of soft actuated microscale robot. So first, let's talk about flapping wing robotics. You know, we have spent the past 10 years making flapping wing robots. We emulate the flapping wing kinematics uh, from nature. So if you think my arm as the leading edge of the wing, right, the robot has two degrees of freedom, the wing stroke motion and the wing pitch motion. Here, the wing stroke motion is uh, completely prescribed by a actuator, and the wing pitch motion is passive. So we have to rely on the passive interaction between the aerodynamics and the inertial effects. We have created experimental setups that allows us to create or record hundreds of those flapping wing videos and by analyzing those videos, we can not only extract the flapping kinematics and forces, but also the instantaneous flow. So we have conducted 2D particle image below symmetry experiment that allow us to measure the instantaneous flow field and also the vorticity field. Just by looking at the vorticity structure, we can infer about the lift and drag generation mechanism of flapping wing insects. On top of experimental setup, we have created numerical tools that allow us to look at the pressure profile on the wing surface and also the isoverticity contour. 
And those computational tools also allow us to understand and optimize the design of wings for those robots. So with that, we start to ask interesting physics questions. So the question that we want to ask ourselves in this case is that is there similarities between flapping in water versus flapping in air? And if there is similarity, then can we enable new functions in microscale robot? So we have came up with a new project in the sense that we want the same micro robot to be able to fly in air, swim in water, and also making transitions from air to water and from water to air. Again, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details, but let me say that the first thing we do is to look into nature for inspiration. In this case, we can see puffins are quite amazing animals. They can fly in the sky, they can take a dive into water. Once they're under the water, they will change or modulate their flapping frequency and kinematics so they can swim around and chase for prey. With that motiv uh, uh, motivation in mind, we came up with a new design of our microscale robot, has new wings for added lift, has uh, new buoyant out triggers for maintaining stability on the water surface, and it has uh, a gas collection chamber for impulsive transition from the water surface back into air. So let me very quickly show you how this works. So the robot starts at the bottom of the tank. It will swim to the air-water interface. Once it reaches the air-water interface, it will turn off the wing, and we will turn on a pair of parallel plates that split water into a, a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. And the gas will slowly push the wings out of the, uh, out of the water. And what's impressive about this design is that the collection of gases will be also serve as chemical fuel, which we will ignite later to break the water surface and propel the robot out of the water. So uh, I recommend you to pay attention to the next video. It's going to be quick. Okay. So in this case, the robot's wings are out of the water surface, and now it's ready for impulsive takeoff. So in the next video, we are going to ignite the gas, and you're going to see a combustion complete within one one thousandth of a second. This microcombustion is strong enough to break the water surface and push the robot out of water. Now, the robot couldn't really fly immediately after it leaves the water surface just because all the water that's on the robot surface is heavier than the robot. So what the robot has to do is that it has to passively land on ground, wait for itself to be dried, and then it can fly to the sky again. So the next video, again, is going to be played in real time just to show you how fast this process is. In real time, we are going to uh, ignite the spark, and you can see the robot will jump off and land. Everything completes within about 0.4 seconds. So let me again show you the same experiment with a high-speed uh, video. The robot again uh, takes off, and it has to passively land on ground. And after it lands on ground, we have to wait for about 15 minutes, and then we can fly the robot again. So in summary, we have created a 175 milligram robot that is capable of doing flight, is capable of swimming, it can transition from air to water. More impressively, it can transition from water to air, impossibly through a combustion, and it can pass you land on ground. Once the robot is dry, you can repeat this cycle. So the theme of our first project is really to convince you that a 0.1 gram robot is capable of locomoting in multiple environments and performing tests that can sometimes be very challenging for larger scale robots. Following the same thread of thought, I want to transition to a second project in which we created a hybrid terrestrial aquatic micro-robot. So in the previous project, we created a robot and we used combustion process to fight against the surface tension. Specifically, we realized that the surface tension forces is over 10 times the robot weight. On the other end of the spectrum, as humans, we barely feel surface tension at all. Our weight is more than a thousand times that of surface tension. Now, if we think about this picture, if we create something in between, if we make a robot that's on the order of a gram, then the surface tension forces and the robot weight are similar. If they're on the same order, then we can leverage surface tension forces to enable new functionalities in the robot. So again, we start with a question for ourselves. How do we control the magnitude of surface tension forces? And if we can control surface tension forces, what new locomotive capabilities can be enabled in microscale robots? So the project is as follows. We want to create a microscale robot that is capable of working on land, on the surface of water, 
controllably transition into water when it wants to, and then overcome surface tension to return back on land. And again, for the interest of time, I'm not going to show you all the implementations. Let me just say that through using electro wetting, we are able to control surface tension forces. And let me show you one experiment that summarizes all of those functionality. So in this case, the robot starts on land. It walks onto the water surface. Now it swims on top of the water surface. So it's really locomoting on the water surface. And once it reaches the targeted site, we are going to use electro wetting, and the robot will submerge underwater. So now I recommend you to focus on the side view of this video. You can see as soon as electro wetting is actuated, the robot sinks underwater, and then it will climb this incline slowly to return back on land. Again, the theme of this work is to demonstrate a one gram robot is able to walk on land, on the surface of water, underwater, and making transitions among those environments. I would argue those tests can be very challenging, if not possible, for larger scale robots. And this is something that we are able to use through surface effects. Until very recently, based on those effects, we started to implement even newer functions, such as teaching the robot to climb on inverted and vertical surfaces. And the idea is similar. We use another uh, capillary effect in this case, we put a very uh, compliant foot pad on the robot, and we put a very thin film of water between the pad and the surface. And this thin water film will be able to create a large normal adhesive force, but very small tangential forces that allow the robot to slide along a surface while remaining attached. So in this case, you can see this is a top-down picture. The robot slides along a inverted surface. And this very simple implementation was able to give us a three times or four times improvement over the state of the art. And the robot can actually climb up to a meter. And we are still working on this to teach the robot to climb on vertical surfaces as well. So in summary, the first two projects convince us that micro robot can do multiple things in multiple environments by leveraging unique physics and the centimeter scale. What I want to focus more on today is to introduce to you a new class of microscale robots that are powered by soft artificial muscles. First, I want to take a step back and say that our longer term vision is to create a swarm of ubiquitous and multifunctional micro robots that can perform in a realistic environment. So how far are we from this picture? Well, all the robots that I'm showing you today are very precise and they can operate at very high frequencies. And my colleagues and my advisors are solving key problems in microrobotics by putting sensors and batteries on board. Right? They're also thinking about putting solar cells and putting power electronics. But I would argue that there are key challenges sometimes that we overlook, which is microrobots are very difficult to make. And as a consequence, everything we have shown you so far involves a single microrobot. Sometimes we spend a week making one robot, and the robot only performs for a few seconds. How do we? Um, make a lot of robots cheaply, and how do we operate them uh, near a very complicated environment, just like what insect can do? Well, I propose we look into another field of robotics, which is soft robotics. For quite a long time now, people know how to make soft robots very cheaply. And also, soft robot has very large actuation. Most soft robots are uh, controlled open loop. In recent years, we start to see more close loop control of soft robots. In addition to using a battery, they can also use pneumatic and chemical sources. But we are aware that soft robots also have their own key challenges. And specifically, they're oftentimes not precise as rigid robots. And also, their bandwidth is often limited. So the functionality of soft robots are usually quite limited compared to rigid driven robots. Our vision is really to merge those two fields and address key challenges in both fields. So we propose a new direction, which we call hybrid soft rigid microrobot. We envision that future microrobot will be powered by power dense soft actuators, but they still have rigid appendages for effective interaction with the environment. So today I want to show you a new robot that we have been working on in MIT, which is really powered by a soft artificial muscle in the center, while they still have precise components such as transmissions and linkages and wings. I want to convince you of several things. First, the soft actuators, in contrary to 
uh, our intuition can operate at very high frequencies, up to 500 hertz. And in addition, they retain relatively large strain at the order of 10 to 15 percent. And because they are soft, we can make a lot of them very cheaply. And also because they are soft, they are tolerated to assembly error. And finally, because they're soft actuators, there are new properties that arise. For example, we can sense collisions in air, and we can also drive them very hard so they can uh, do aggressive maneuvers such as somersault. In short, the soft actuated robot has a similar architecture as the rigid actuated flying robot. It has wings, transmissions, and, uh, and wing hinges. The unique thing now is we spend a lot of time trying to build an artificial muscle that has sufficient power density to support flight. So our research is mostly motivated by the desire to address key challenges in the field. So let's now think about what are the major challenges. To me, there are three major questions we, we, we need to answer in the short term and also in the longer term. The short term question is, can a soft actuated robot fly? So far, we don't really see a lot of soft actuator that can support flight. The second question is, if we can build a soft flying robot, what additional functions can we enable? And the third question is our longer term goal, which is, OK, now we have a swarm of soft flying robot. What longer term goal are we trying to achieve? So let's answer those questions one at a time. So first, can a soft robot fly? I want to convince you that, yes, a soft robot can fly. And in fact, I'm going to show you liftoff. I'm going to show you controlled hovering flight. And I'm also going to show you trajectory tracking flight. But first, let's think about what are the necessary criteria for actuator such that the actuator can support flight. We start with comparing the soft actuator with a more traditional piezoelectric actuator. The piezoelectric actuator is great in the sense that it has very high bandwidth. You can operate that at over kilohertz. But on the other hand, um, it has very tiny strain, only on the order of 0.2% strain. There are two consequences. One is very difficult for you to assemble this actuator into a robot. And two, because it has very tiny strain, if the robot wings hit an obstacle, the stress that's, uh, that's been passed to the actuator can very easily induce a large strain and crack the actuator. So in contrast to insects that can always fly around flowers and bushes, most rigidly flying micro robots are sort of tied to a safety tether so that they don't collide with the environment. On the other end of the spectrum, we created a, a dielectric elastomer actuator that has a relatively high bandwidth on the order of 500 hertz. But the good thing about this actuator, it has a large uh, strain on the order of 12%. And it can, has, it can tolerate a large assembly error on the order of 100 micron. Instead of spending a week to assemble a micro robot, my student now can assemble them in 30 minutes. So that's really the ability for us to build and test very quickly. So with this actuator, let's think about what are the critical criteria for achieving flight. The first condition is that the lift force has to balance the robot weight. Um, again, for today, don't worry about exact formulas. Let's just think about a high-level concept. And the second condition is that if you want to fly, you're really fighting against the drag forces. That's the force that's taking away power from the system. So the DA's block force has to fight against the, the drag force through a transmission. And the third condition is that you have to design your robot such that the resonance of the system is matched with the resonance of the actuator. So from the perspective of the actuator, there are three key criteria, which is the bandwidth, the free displacement, and the block force. You have to achieve a certain number of performance metrics such that you can enable flight. So let's talk about how we characterize those for the microscale soft actuator. First, we think about the bandwidth of the actuator. We modeled the soft actuator as a series RC circuit. And we optimize the electrode property such that we can reduce the resistance and increase the capacitance. And we realize that the electrical resonance of the system is on the order of 5,000 hertz. So this really implies the, the resonance of this actuator is, is limited by the mechanical property. We spend a lot of time to tune the geometry of the actuator and the viscoelastic property of the elastomer so we can improve the resonance frequency. In the end, through choosing the elastomer composition and the geometry, we are able to uh, measure a resonant frequency on the order of 500 hertz. Now, having known the resonant frequency of the system, let's measure the block force. 
you can place an actuator under a nano 17 titanium force sensor, and you can measure the force at a particular driving condition. So we define the block force as the zero to peak force in this case at the particular driving frequency and amplitude. And you can vary the driving frequency and amplitude at different conditions so you can construct a map. So this map will be able to tell you what the block force actuator is producing at a particular operating frequency and at a particular driving voltage amplitude. And after that, we can measure the free motion of the actuator. In this case, we place an actuator under a laser vibrometer, and we measure the peak-to-peak -peak motion as the free displacement. And similarly, you can measure this peak-to-peak uh, -peak motion for different combinations of driving frequency and voltage amplitude. And you can see that the system response resembles a second-order system in the sense that the resonant behavior is really uh, near 500 hertz. So with those three measurements, then we can calculate the energy density of the actuator and the power density of the actuator. And then coming back to the first three equations, I just want to say that our calculation says that if the power density of the actuator is higher than 200 watt per kilogram, then it's possible to enable flight. And in this case, our actuator uh, already has a power density on the order of 500 to 600 kilo, uh, watt per kilogram, which means that we are very close to uh, enable flight. So motivated by that analysis, we put a soft actuator into a flying robot. And this high-speed video shows the robot is driving at 280 hertz. And this is what we have been able to achieve about three years ago. Just looking at the kinematics, right? We, that really is uh, an encouraging result that suggests the robot is able to generate enough forces for liftoff. And with that, we try to demonstrate a liftoff experiment. In this case, you can see the soft artificial muscles really operates like muscles, right? They contract and they elongate. And it was a very exciting moment to us three years ago in that we showed the first soft actuated robot is able to take off. Now, if you're a soft roboticist, you're very excited by this result. But if you work on aerial robot, this is you know, not so exciting because the robot is intrinsically unstable flips over within 0.1 seconds, so it's really not very useful at this stage yet. So the critical question for us is how do we stabilize this robot? Well, we can stabilize this robot by putting two units together, and we can use a phenomenon called precession. And the idea is that if I can somehow trigger a fast rotation relative to the robot's yaw axis, then the robot behaves as a spinning top. And if I spin fast enough, then I can fight against the, uh, the, the disturbances. For the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the proofs, but let me just say that whether you're stable or not depends on how big the yaw torque you're going to generate uh, compared to the moment of inertia tensor that the robot has. And again, skipping over the proof, let me just say that in both experiment and in simulation, we're able to show the robot can achieve passive upright stability in the sense that it can uh, passively fly upward without needing any feedback and control. So again, that's a very exciting result for us three years ago. With no visual feedback, no position tracking, the robot can just fly upwards just by using precession alone. And we can show that both in experiment and in simulation. So that was very exciting. The robot reached a speed of 30 centimeters per second, already one of the fastest among the soft robots. But the core question I think we want to address is, you know, we know the robot can take off, can achieve passive upright stability. But are soft robots controllable? Especially, can we control them at very high bandwidth, hundreds or thousands of hertz? So our team has been working on the flight controller for quite some time now. So now I'm going to show you a hovering video we have achieved uh, last summer. So in this video, we fly the robot for about 20 seconds. And this is the first time we are able to you know, show you a flying video in real time. You can see the robot is really quite stable. It's, it sort of stays around the set point with a maximum error on the order of two centimeters. And all of those are achieved with a simple dynamic model with a PD controller. Okay? So as a quick summary, this flight is about 20 seconds. And the maximum position error is about two centimeters in those two 20 seconds. And the maximum attitude error is also about two, two degrees. So very impressive flight compared to any of the state-of-art subgram robot. 
And our team is continuing to push on that. And I'm happy to report that as of last week, we are submitting our new work to ICRA. We are able to achieve a 40-second hovering flight. We are just trying to show our robot has longer and longer lifetime. But there is one shortcoming, which is that the robot can control its position and attitude, but it cannot control its heading angle. So the heading angle really drifts very slowly over time. Unlike quad rotors that can fix its uh, pose at one direction, this soft robot sort of just drifts along passively. So how do we uh, control the heading angle of this robot such that in the future we can put a tiny camera on board and have the robot to track an object or track a flower, for example? With that, we come up with a slightly new configuration. In this new robot, we tilted the robot in assembly. You can see this 15 degree tilt angle. And the idea is quite simple. We borrow ideas from tilt copters in the quad rotor community so that with this tilt angle, we can use part of the lift forces to generate uh, a yaw torque. And we can use this control of yaw torque to help the robot to control its yaw angle. So now I'm going to show you a 10 second flight in which this is our first demonstration of heading angle control. Right? So in this case, the robot will fly up and it will turn to the left and then it will turn to the right, and then it will turn to a normal position, and then it will land on ground. Okay, so in summary, you can follow this reference trajectory quite well. The maximum air is on the water of 10 degree. Right? We still need to improve the position tracking. I think the position air now increased by a little bit to on the water of you know, a couple of centimeters. But again, to us, the heading angle is much more important than a couple of centimeters in the uh, position set points. And up until, up until this point, everything that we do are composed of a very simple PD controllers. We are not a control lab, so we look to collaborate with control scientists on implementing more fancy algorithms on those small flying platforms. So until very recently, we are collaborating with Professor Johnson Howe in MIT to work on a neural network-based controller. The idea is that they implemented a tube MPC controller, and then they trained a, uh, net, a, a neural network to represent that so they can run this at a very fast rate on the order of two kilohertz. And it turns out that the neural network controller is very good in terms of one, running at a really high frequency, but two, to reject a small a, 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 a noise. So what people have been able to do is that they sort of fly with a safety tether and they hit the tether and you can see the robot is quite robust to those disturbances. They can recover quite quickly and in fact, if you look at the Z position, they're trying to follow a ramp in here. The Z position is followed very well. And in addition to that, the neural network-based controller is quite good for following a fixed trajectory. In this case, this is the first time we are trying to demonstrate a, a, a circular trajectory. Right? In this case, the robot flies up, and then it comes back down. And this entire flight is on the order of eight seconds. So if you look at the tracked X position and the Z position, we can argue that in terms of the circular trajectory tracking is a lot better than what the PD controller can do. But of course, there's a lot of work that we still need to do for, the, for implementing those complex controllers. And I'm happy to tell you more about it because it is a very painful process to train them and to debug and tune the parameters of those controllers. Okay, so the first part of this project, hopefully I've convinced you that soft actually a robot can do a lot of the things that the rigid state-of-the-art micro-scale robot can do. Now I'm going to talk about unique functions of the self-actuated aerial robot. Specifically, I want to argue that because the self-actuator is very robust, now we can sense in-flight collisions and also recover from in-flight collisions. And also because they are robust, I can drive them very harsh. I can turn them on and off within five milliseconds so the robot can do a somersault. And finally, because I fabricate those uh, soft actuators in-house, we can put new chemicals into the actuator so the actuator can shine out light and we can use that for tracking or communication. So let's talk about robustness first. You know, the, the robot wing can repeatedly hit an obstacle. If this is a piezoelectric driven uh, actuator, then the stress will induce a larger strain on the piezoelectric actuator and that's not good for the actuator. But the soft actuator can take that. And not only that, if you monitor the instantaneous current of the self-actuator, you can use the current to detect collisions. And because I can drive them very harshly, 
I can turn them on and off very quickly so I can demonstrate a somersault. And more than that, I can command them to shine out light during flight and use that for motion tracking. So very quickly, I just want to say that we can fly two of them for the first time. In this case, we are not doing anything fancy. We just directly or intentionally run them into walls just to demonstrate they're very robust against collisions. The longer term goal of this type of demonstration is really to show we can do pollination or landing on a flower. Right? In this case, it really um, sort of embodies both very agile maneuvers, but also insect-like uh, resilience to collisions. The next thing we want to demonstrate is we take inspiration from a very famous MIT robot, the MIT Cheetah Mini. If you kick on the Cheetah Mini, the Cheetah Mini can recover. And also, the, mo the motors are powerful enough such that it can do a somersault. So we ask the question if our robot can do similar things. So in this case, we fly this robot, and we use a rod to hit the robot. So in the first hit, it's very gentle, right? The robot can recover to the hovering set point. I would say that this is something that most quadrotors can do anyways. You push it away from the hovering set point, and then it just returns. And now it becomes interesting. If I hit the actuator or the wings, then it's not going to be turned well for the quadrotor. Especially, imagine you hit the propellers of a quadrotor in flight. But because it's a flapping wing system, you know, the actuator didn't really care when it's been hit. And in the third case, you can hit it really hard. In some cases, the robot cannot recover, but it can just bounce on the floor and return to the hovering uh, set point. This is a consequence of the fact that you have very tiny inertia, so the collision really doesn't uh, influence the uh, stability of the robot as much. So in summary, we have a robot that can survive a gentle collision. We have a robot that can survive collision with actuators and wings. And also, if it hits really hard, then it bounces on the floor and recovers. And we use that consequence to show somersault demonstrations. Okay? So next, in simulation, we try to show our robot can do a somersault. And because it has very tiny inertia, our simulation shows the robot can make a flip within 0.15 seconds among the fastest among any aerial robots. And let me show you that in, uh, in uh, experiments. Again, it's going to be quite quick because micro robot just operates in a, in a very short time scale. So the robot take off and then it try to do a, a hovering flight and then it return or it try to do a flip and then it reco recovers to the uh, hovering condition. So let me play it slow down. The robot takes off and hover around the set point and then it accelerates upward. You can see it tries to make a somersault try to recover altitude, but the uh, flight arena is really not big enough for it to recover altitude, so it bounces on the floor, but then it returns to the hovering set point. At MIT, we are trying to rebuild a larger flight arena so that we hopefully one day can do a somersault without needing to hit the floor. So again, in summary, our robot can take off and hover. It can ascend very fast upwards, and then it will perform a very quick somersault within 0.16 seconds it will try to recover stability, and finally, it will return to the hovering set point. This is a very repeatable process. We can repeat this uh, hovering flight five times, and we can see very small changes to the performance of the robot. And until very recently, we started to look for even newer functions. We take inspiration from fireflies in nature. So fireflies, they shine out light when they fly, and they use that as a way of communication or even to evade predator or, or track prey. So to enable similar functions, we put zinc oxide particles into the elastomer in the fabrication process. And what you can see is that when we turn on the robot, those individual actuators can shine out different color or different pattern light depending on how we fabricate them. And based on that, we can show that we can track the robot motion using a couple of iPhone cameras. In this case, you know, by just those three iPhone videos, we can try to reconstruct or track the spatial position orientation of the robot. Traditionally, when we fly the robot, you have to put on tiny Wicom motion tracking markers, and then you have to use a set of very expensive Wicom cameras to look and track the robot at a very high frequency. But now, what we demonstrated, we can use three iPhones, and we can try to do uh, uh, real-time image tracking on those iPhones. So let me show you the track result. Compared to the Wicom result, the iPhone result, I think, is, is quite close. 
right? Um, we couldn't do it at as a fast rate as what the Vicon can do, which is 400 hertz. We can do it probably at 30 hertz. Um, but in terms of the quality of the tracking, we can get a RMS tracking error of 2.5 millimeter and two degree. So we hope that one day we can replace Wicon, just use a couple of iPhone cameras and do real time tracking and control. So with that, let me summarize the additional unique function that soft aerial robot can achieve. We show that soft robot can be robust, agile, and can demonstrate unique functions. By robust, we mean soft robot can survive and recover from in-flight collisions. By agile, we mean that they can do a somersault. And now the maximum ascending speed is about 70 centimeters per second. Considering they're only two centimeters long, I would argue that this is already one of the fastest soft robots out there. And finally, you can do swarm flight and shine out light. And we are still thinking about sort of an application that can combine all those properties together. So now I just want to move to the longer term goal, right? We, we, we implement a lot of interesting function, but what are the most challenging thing that we are trying to accomplish right now? I think I would argue this is power autonomy, right? If we can't carry its own batteries and power electronics, it's impossible to deploy them in a realistic environment. And we are aware of the gap between soft actuators and rigid actuators. Let me start by saying that Back in 2019, my advisor, Professor Zhao Wood, published a paper on the cover of Nature that has a power autonomous microflying robot that can carry its own boot circuit and a solar cell. And the reason that the robot can do that is because the piezoelectric actuator are really good in the sense that it has very high power density. The robot is well tuned such that it has very high lift to weight ratio, it requires about 200 volts but the actuator efficiency is also very high. If you compare those metrics with the soft actuator, you will see that our first robot, published also in Nature in 2019, has half the power density, 20 to 30% of the lift to weight ratio, requires seven times higher voltage, and only has about 6% efficiency. So this is too far away from being able to carry power electronics and batteries. So what should we do? Right? We have spending a lot of time to improve the soft actuators, as of last year, we published a paper in TRO in the sense that we significantly improved the power density of the actuator. The lift to weight ratio now is about half of what the robot can do. We require much higher voltage because we changed the elastomer we are using, but we are also able to get higher efficiency. But we are still very far away. So let's think about the major challenge here. The major challenge is really the actuation voltage. If you look, if you work in power electronics, you will realize that very difficult to find um, a small MOSFET that can operate at 500 or 600 volt or beyond. So 600 volt is really the higher limit we can operate at. So the core challenge is really to reduce the, uh, the actuation voltage so that we can achieve power autonomy. On the high level, the DEA is made by a elastomer layer sandwiched by compliant electro layers. And you need to apply a high voltage that induces an electric field within the elastomer so you can have actuation. So theoretically, if I just make the elastomer layer thinner and thinner, I can use a lower and lower voltage. So theoretically, it's very simple. And we use a spin coating method to make our uh, elastomer sheet. So all we need to do really from a theoretical perspective is you just spin coat faster with a, and fabricate a thinner elastomer layer so you can reduce the actuation voltage. But of course, from a fabrication perspective, it's never this easy. If we do this, you will see that you induce both macroscopic unevenness that cause early breakdown along the edges. And also, you induce a lot of tiny bubbles within the elastomer layer that will reduce the quality of your actuator. So my student has spent a lot of time last year improving the fabrication procedure. And let me just say the key insight is really you have to pull vacuum every time you spin coat. And the vacuum is good enough in that it will remove the macroscopic unevenness, and also it will remove almost all the small bubbles trapped within the elastomers. So with that, we are able to push the breakdown or the dielectric, the dielectric strength or the breakdown voltage up by about 20%. And because the power density is proportional to the force power of the dielectric strength, this really has a huge influence on the performance of the, the actuator. So with that, we are able to make a similar actuator, a similar size actuator that has a lot more layers, and each layer has a much thinner thickness. And with that, we are able to show that 
different layered actuator can generate similar block force and free displacement. And the key takeaway is that with that, we can achieve similar performance with a much lower driving voltage. This is what the um, kinematics of a two kilovolt actuator can achieve. And this is what we are able to achieve at the beginning of this year with just 630 volt. You can see that those two systems are approximately generating similar kinematics and similar forces. So in summary, as of a few months ago, we are able to get a soft robot that is able to produce similar power density, similar lift to weight ratio, moderate efficiency, but we have been able to reduce the takeoff voltage to about 500 volt. This really opens up the opportunity for making power electronics. So now we have been looking into simple topologies. This is still very preliminary work. We have been looking at a tap inductor boost topology. And in our lab, we have the capability of making our own power electronics in that we created a 127 milligram circuit fully equipped with transformers, MOSFET, and its microcontrollers, and et cetera. And with that, we put, we put together a robot that has its own power electronics and a 116 milligram robot. Okay, so with this power electronics, we can generate a 600 volt, 400 hertz driving signal by just requiring a 7.7 .7 volt uh, input. So again, the robot is still tethered, but instead of requiring a high voltage input, we now just require a DC 7 volt input. This is really preparing us for putting batteries on board. And with this very simple circuit, we are able to generate quite decent flapping wing kinematics. And for now, we're really trying not to do control visit. We're just trying to show lift off. So we put the robot on a lift off stand. If the robot can generate a large enough force compared to its own weight, it will uh, lift off in this direction and the lift off stand will rotate. So let me show you um, a very um, recent work that we submitted to ICRA next year which is that first, now this robot is driven by our circuit, but the circuit is placed off board, and we put a 120 milligram payload um, on the lift-off stand. In the second demonstration, we mount the power electronics on board. Now the power electronics here, and it's connected through two SICK wires to a 7.7 .7 power supply. Right now, instead of requiring 600 volt, it just requires 7.7 .7 volt. But of course, we are still very far away from achieving power autonomy, Incorporating onboard computation is relatively easy, but developing onboard energy sources is extremely challenging. And we are really looking for collaborators who can make very tiny and power dense um, uh, small batteries for us. With that, let me just say that we are also working on a couple of other projects, such as a dragonfly like robot. I'm personally very interested in looking at wing wing interactions of multiple wing systems. We are collaborating with Professor Rob Shepard from Cornell to make a combustion-powered micro-robot. Again, counterintuitive in the sense that a soft actuator can operate at 165 hertz in this case. We are thinking about flying a lot of micro-robots together, and we are thinking about teaching our soft robot to do multiple things, such as landing on flowers or tree branches. Finally, let me just zoom out a little bit and say that we are still very far away from deploying a large number of micro-scale robots in complex environments. But hopefully I've convinced you that we, we are making progress very quickly, putting on power electronics, enabling new flight ability, and et cetera. I would argue that the next 10 to 15 years is going to be a very exciting time for people who work on micro-robotic systems. With that, I want to thank my advisors, Professor Rob Wood, David Clark, and Jane Wong, my past collaborators, and most importantly now, we have a small group in MIT, and a lot of the work I presented today are really led by my students. And if you're interested in our work, please you know, send me an email. I'm more than happy to collaborate and talk to you more about our work. I'm happy to stop here and take questions. Thank you. Right, so, so, so that's a very good question. So we make everything in-house. That means airframe, actuators, wings, transmissions. There is a, a fabrication method called smart composite manufacturing method. All of those major components, all of those nice features are cut by lasers. 
and we make all those components and the grass you need to assemble the component. There's another method for just automating the assembly in the sense that everything is going to be made in one laminate. So when you take it out, the full robot is finished. Now, it takes a lot of effort in designing that robot. So I would say that once you have a mature robot, you can use that to make a lot of them. But we are still in the prototyping stage. So I'm asking my student to make each individual component and assemble them by hand. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, are you looking into any way in which, like, if you can have multiple actuators on the robot, and then uh, if you can even, like, rather than passively controlling wings, if you can actually control the wings, and then you can fly the robot, like, in more, more controllable manner? Yeah, so, so that's a very good question. Um, I think the question is about if you look at the robot B, the piezoelectric actuator robot, just two actuators, the robot can fly quite well. Whereas in this robot, we have four actuators, and it really looks like a small quad rotor, right? So, why is that? Well, if you look at the control architecture of the RoboB, what you can do is that you can use higher order harmonics to induce asymmetry in the flapping wing pattern. So for example, if I want to generate a, a, a pitch torque, I bias the voltage a little bit, so I'm flapping a little bit to the front. You couldn't really do that with the soft actuator. Not saying you couldn't. Uh, if you look at the dynamics of the soft actuator, it's actually nonlinear. So whatever signal you put in, you get that signal squared. So as a consequence, we are using resonance to filter out the higher order harmonics. While this is very efficient energetically, it's very bad for control. So if you're interested in control, what you have to do is to first characterize the nonlinear model, find the inverse mapping, and then you will be able to do something similar to what the RoboBees can do. So I think at this point, we are more interested in thinking about realizing insight-like functions, not as much as implementing insect-like control method. So that's why we are not looking extensively in the nonlinear mode of the soft actuators. But this is for sure a very interesting question. And again, if you're interested in learning more about it, more than happy to come back and show you what I mean by those nonlinear T's. Yeah. Yes? So, yeah, so that's a very good question. It, it used to be, for most systems, the, um, the actuator has a very short lifetime. So we've been working on the actuator for quite long now. Now the actuator actually has very long lifetime. Our actuator has a lifetime on the way of two million actuation cycle, which is if you count for nonstop flapping, they can operate at an hour and a half, right? The, the main issue now we have is the wing hinges. The lifetime of the wing hinges is on the way of 200 seconds. And you know, in, in the robot, you have eight pair or four pair of wings, so eight wing hinges and wings. Any one of them, if uh, is, is, is not good, then the robot will fall, right? So yes, theoretically, if you, I put on all new uh, wing hinges, then you can fly for more than 40 seconds. But we are just slowly trying to improve the lifetime of the wing hinges. That's where the bottleneck is, so that we can fly for longer and longer time. But that's a very good question. Yeah, so, so the question is, if you reduce the layer thickness of the elastomer, will, for example, the strain become smaller, right? That's a very good question. Um, that really depends on what electrode you're choosing, right? The elastomer, no matter how thin or how thick you're making it, that's the thing that's uh, going to change in shape. If you use metal, for example, if you use better called copper or gold, that turns out to have, to have very high modulus. And when you reduce the thickness, the strain will become significantly smaller. In this case, we are using carbon nanotube. And the carbon nanotube is not changing shape. They're sliding along each other. So what I can say is that in terms of the strain or the, or, or the modulus performance of the actuator, we see less than 0.5% change when reducing it from 40 micron to 10 micron. So at this point, the carbon nanotube electrode is not affecting, affecting the strain yet. Yeah. Yeah, please.
Thank you. Oh, so okay, so that so so again, that's a really good question. I, I would say this: um, my background was in physics, so I did a, many years of simulation. Um, at the same, if you are comparing a rotor blade and a flapping wing system at the same scale, and if they operate at the same speed, then the rotary system will be more efficient, but the flapping wing system will generate more forces per area, which means it's easier for shrinking down in size. So there is a famous saying of if you replace the wings of bees or mosquitoes with propellers, they couldn't fly anymore, providing they're operating at the same speed. Well, I would say in the Reynolds number between, let's say, from 100 to 10,000 in, uh, in that region. But the practical thing also is very difficult to make a small rotary motor. I think for motors, when the uh, size reduced down to about a couple of millimeters, when the weight reduced down to 0.5 gram, the, the, the scaling of the torque density is so low that it really makes small motors unattractive for those type of motion. So that's why people look at linear oscillation, such as piezos or DEAs, and that's where it's even hard to enable very, very tiny rotary systems in microscale systems. Yeah, thank you. Sure, I, I think that's a, a, a very good question, and frankly, I don't have a, a very good answer for that yet. This is also something we are thinking about. You know, my background was not in control, so I, so, you know, I just do very simple PD control to get them to fly, and they seem to be working quite well. Um, and then we have collaborators using very complicated MPC or tube MPC or uh, neural network-based controllers. I think the key takeaway is this for me, which is there was physicists saying that you should at least sense, sense at least as fast as one wing beat uh, uh, each time for, for the robot to be stable, which means if the robot is flapping at 500 hertz, you should at least sense at 500 hertz. And that's more or less what we are finding. If you're operating your control loop at a much lower frequency, or if you're sensing at a much lower frequency, then it's very hard to fly those guys. And somehow the PD controllers are so simple that you can operate them at 10 kilohertz. The MPCs, you can really run them at 200 hertz. So if you compare a 10 kilohertz controller with a 200 hertz controller, we are very certain that, that the, the, the 10 kilohertz controller is much better. But if you reduce the, the frequency of the PD controller to 200 hertz, then the MPC is much better. That's where the neural network comes in. You have to train very small, very uh, specialized neural net controllers that they can run at 2 kilohertz, and that's where they get their performance boost. So in the longer term, I would say, in contrast to what Insect is doing, I'm more in favor of using some mode of passive stability. Hopefully the robot can be uh, on a larger, uh, higher level passively stable, so I don't need to sense very quickly. But whenever I need to make a decision, then maybe instead of sensing 500 times per, per second, I can sense one or two times per second just to roughly get myself to that the direction. So I think that's where we should be moving to. So you have just small quantum mechanical Yeah, I, I think we have just have to tackle a very difficult problem from many perspectives. <laughs>